So good evening, good morning, good afternoon uh, to all of you around the world and around South Africa. My name is Tali Nates. I'm the director of the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center, and it's wonderful to welcome you to this webinar tonight. Um, it is also wonderful to welcome Gail Newman uh, all the way from San Francisco to join us and to uh, share with us her expertise and uh, her life story and story through poems. It is a great pleasure to welcome our colleagues from the three centers in South Africa. So a warm welcome to the Durban, Cape Town, and of course Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Centers, to their staff and to their volunteers. As a center of memory, education, and lessons for humanity, we are really honored to, to that, tonight explore memory, education, and lessons for humanity through poetry. And poetry and memory workshop will share a gaze over those issues from a very different lens. On her website that we will share in the chat, Gail Newman says, people can withstand the most horrific experiences and build meaningful and even joyful lives. We remember the Holocaust to honor the living and the dead. And we remember so that we will be vigilant and compassionate so that we don't stand idle when others of any religion or race <laughs> Sorry, Tally seems to have frozen now. Hopefully she... Tonight. I met Gail in 2016. Uh, di when, when did I freeze? Sorry, my, my internet is very <laughs> unstable tonight. <laughs> So um, I had the honor of, did you hear the, the quote? I hope, I yes, hope you, yes. you heard the quote. So let me just start again with the introduction. I met Gail uh, during the March of the Living, 2016. I was the scholar of the international, uh, international group of adults that came from all over the world. And we were privileged to, Gail, to have Gail with us. Let me introduce Gail to you. Gail Newman was born in a displaced persons camp in Landsberg, Germany. She was raised in Los Angeles in a community of Holocaust survivors. She lives in San Francisco Bay Area, where she works as a poet teacher for California poets in the schools. A former arts administrator and museum educator at the Contemporary Jewish Museum, she was the co-publisher and editor of Room, a woman's literary journal. She also edited Inside Out, a book of poetry lessons for teachers, as well as two collections of children's poems, C is for California and De Dear Earth. A collection of her poetry, One World, was published by Moon Tide Press. Her latest book that we are going to deal with tonight, Blood Memory, was published in 2019 and was chosen by Marge Piercy for the Marsh Hawk Press Poetry Prize. Gail's poems have appeared in many journals and anthologies, including Ghosts of the Holocaust and Prism. She won many awards. The time doesn't allow me to, uh, uh, to say them all, but let me just mention the last one, the two 2020 Nimrod Lit literary award. It is a real pleasure to welcome you. The floor is yours, Gail. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tali. I'm so, I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here today because um, I'm so happy to see you again and to see so many people from all over the world. So thank you, Tali Nays, for inviting me. And thank you, Catherine Boyd, for being the host. <laughs> I'm looking forward to talking to all of you today. Um, as Tali said, we met in 2016, and I was on a quest. I was in the midst of writing my book, and I had always wanted to go to Poland, but my parents didn't want to go back. 
my mother actually went back after the war and it was a terrible experience for her. There's a poem about that experience in my book and um, she just never wanted to go. But I did a lot of research while I was there and I found out a lot about my parents that I didn't know before. Um, the book, this is the book Blood Memory and I'm showing it to you because I, it's hard to see, but there's, this is a street in, in Lodz. I say Lodz, some people say Wooch. I'm not sure how Tali would pronounce it, but my parents said Lodz and so I'm going with that because they're the Holocaust survivors. But this is a street in Lodz and there's a picture of my parents here. They're embracing each other. And this picture was taken in Landsberg in the DP camp where I was born. And I'll tell you a little secret if you promise not to tell, my mother is pregnant in this picture. So she's actually, you can, it's hard to see, she has a big belly, but she's pregnant with me. So I feel like I'm also in the picture and on the cover of the book. Although I don't wanna be the main person, so I'm so, somewhat hidden. So I, I gave this book to my mother on her 99th birthday, shortly after the book was published. It was published in May actually just before it was published. And she looked at the photograph, she said, and my mother's 99 years old. She's, she's doing well, her mind is good. She's getting a little hunched over, but other than that, she's pretty good. So she looked at the photograph, she said, that's my street. I said, no, mom, you know, this is not your street, but your street is a block away from here. Because I chose this photograph because you can see there's a, plaza at the very end and it's one of the main plazas in the city where four streets come together and my mother lived on one of those streets so um you know i'm interested that a lot of people here are not poets but are interested in poetry and when i started writing this book you know i am 74 years old i say that with astonishment because sometimes i forget after I turned 70, I started forgetting how old I was. <laughs> and my mother definitely forgets. She thinks I'm still six. You know, it's just like I think my son is still a baby, even though he's in his 30s. <laughs> but, you know, it took, I've been writing and teaching poetry my entire life. And it's taken me until now to write this book about the Holocaust. And people ask me, why haven't you written this book before? You know, it makes me feel emotional just to talk about it because I tried writing these poems when I was in my 20s and I just couldn't, I could not do it. You know, it's taken me my entire life to be able to express myself in this way through poetry about my parents. And I think about it, you know, maybe part of it was because it was painful, maybe because you know, I don't have an answer. I'm just, you know, this is off the top of my head. You know, maybe it's because I had to grow up. I had to become an adult and step away before I could, you know, if I would have written this in my 20s, it would have been a very different book. It would have been about, oh, my parents, they don't let me go out and they're so repressive and I can't do this and I can't, you know, that's not what it's about. You know, this book is about my family it's about, it's an immigrant story. It's about resilience and strength. And it's about everything I learned and got from my parents that made me who I am. And, you know, think, I think about who I am and I'm like, I'm good. You know, I'm a good person. And I got that from my, from my family and from my parents. So, um, you know, another thing about my book is I wanted, to be, I wanted it to be accessible. I want people to be able to read this book. You know, a lot of people who, who read and buy poetry books, they're mostly poets. And I wanted people who are not poets to read my book. And so one of my best experiences was I read, I read a couple of poems to a friend whose husband never reads poetry. He doesn't, he's not interested in reading at all. And he, he, I read him one of the poems and he, he cried. And I thought, this is what I want. This, I want people not to cry or to feel sad, but I want them to be able to read my book. I want Holocaust survivors to read my book and say, oh, this is poetry. I understand this. this is really what I want to hear. So um, 
then maybe there was a part of me that felt like, well, I wasn't there. I'm not a survivor. I wasn't there. What right do I have to write about this? Or how can I even express it? So one of the ways I came to do it was in the 80s, I actually went to uh, Los Angeles with a friend of mine who does radio documentaries. And she brought all her fancy equipment. Of course, we didn't have computers then, so it was these huge microphones. And you know, we sat with my parents and interviewed them. And I learned a lot from my family that they would never tell me because you know they don't want to hurt their children. They don't want to talk about this. You know, my mother never spoke about it. My father would speak about it when I was older in a very kind of uh, quiet, kind of reserved way without emotion, which I think you find a lot of people who've gone through traumas and wars talk about it that way because they can't get too emo if they if they get into the emotion they really can't talk about it you know the only time i heard my father really break down and cry was when i went with my parents to the holocaust museum in washington dc and we went with a group of survivors they were all my parents friends i was the only young person there and on the bus with them and when we walked into that museum my father broke down because it was so real to him you know the, the it's just and we left we had to we had to leave so um you know poetry i think poetry you know the documents are so strong the, the survivors testimonies that i would i would say that's the first thing to read the second thing would be the poetry i wouldn't I would say read both, you know, one doesn't substitute for the other. Um, and the poems that I'm writing, you know what you said about poetry being like a painting? Well, that's what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> so thank you for that. Because there's many ways to approach poetry and I have different types of poetry in my book. The ones that I'm going to read are the ones that are really based on images. And I'm going to be talking about imagery, imagery, which is painting a picture with words. And so that's, that's a lot what I'm going to be talking about. Um, you know, I feel like poetry is one way of preserving memory. And, you know, I was really happy. I don't want to get political, but I was very happy being a, a United States citizen to see that yesterday, Facebook decided to take off those Holocaust deniers. And, you know, I was, thank you, Facebook. Now I'm okay with using Facebook. I was really feeling a little uncomfortable. <laughs> so, you know, what's going on in the world today is like we're seeing more anti-Semitism, more racism. I mean, in our country, you know, everybody knows what's going on right now and it's very, very disturbing. So when I talk about remembering the Holocaust, I've always felt like this. It's not just about remembering what happened to the Jews or what happened to the, you know, you know, homosexuals or all the people during the Holocaust. It's about not letting this happen again and being very vigilant and paying attention to what's going on in our world. So um, I think I'll move on to the to the poems and read you a couple of poems. So I have two poems here, Kath, if you would just go to the first one. It's called After the Hanging. And these are poems from the book. This is the first section of the book. So in the first, sec the first section of the book is about th the war. And these are events that took place during the war. So we can move on to the next part. So this is the poem called After the Hanging. And um, it's, this is the town my father was from, Virginie. And I read a book written by the survivors they were memories of the town and it was a book it was written in yiddish a group of survivors who lived in chicago and then it was translated into english and this is this is a book of their memories of this town and so i was i was reading about the town and i learned a lot about the town and there was this one incident about this hanging and i thought oh my god you know my my father never mentioned this he never talked about it but I'm sure that he was there. So this is called After the Hanging, Virginie, 1939. 
the band, some shouldering violins began to play. Children lifted up, were cautioned not to look away. Fega, the water carrier, standing by the well, raised the bucket but did not drink. Munzia, the mad, laughed and cried, her sandals sinking in mud. The soldiers ordered the women to crouch at their feet, kissing the filthy boots. Apple trees hung in bloom, polish, pollen vanishing into the muddled air. My father must have stood in that crowd, one hand pressing his glasses to the bridge of his nose, the other hand fingering scraps of fabric and tailor's chalk in his pocket. So um, my father told me about this town. This was a town of tailors. And everyone, even the rabbi, they said, was a tailor. So the poem at the end, I'm imagining what I think my father would be doing there. But this entire poem is based on a witness account. And that's the poems that I'm reading today are based on that. So they're not embellished. There are not a lot of metaphors. It's all images. It's what happened at that time. This is a specific scene. And every single uh, line has an image. It paints a picture. You see the band, they're playing violins. You see the water carrier, she's standing by the well. Now, some of these I made up, like there, it didn't say sinking in mud. No, one of the survivors didn't say that. So when you're writing a poem, you know, it's not all truth. The, poem, the poet can add some things out of the poet's imagination. And um, one time I did this with my mother, I wrote a poem about her and I said, mom, I know this is not true. This, it was, it, I said she had a blue number on her arm and she doesn't. She said, that's okay because you need that in the poem. So, um, so every poem has an image. Now I'd like to read the next poem. Let's go on to the next one. So this again, is a poem of images and a poem of witness. It's Cousins in Auschwitz. After the lines parted, my grandmother sent to the left, my mother and Malka sent to the right, their heads shaven, clothes taken away. My mother was given shoes, one black, one brown, while Malka disappeared in a dress that fell to the floor. In the camp, my mother and Malka kept close. They shared crumbs, stood together at roll call. When the capo slapped my mother and her glasses fell to the ground, Malka picked them up out of the dust, settled them back over my mother's eyes. They kept alive, pressed close on a wooden plank, strangers above and below, one breaths on the other's face. So um, can we go back to me and then come back to the PowerPoint? I don't, I'm not sure how that works. So thank you so much for doing this amazing PowerPoint because I am so low tech. <laughs> it was like, I was, I was really grateful for that. So again, um, this poem is, is constructed with images and images are the things in a poem that paint the picture. So I'm sure we've all heard these stories. I call them stories. My mother says, they're not stories, they're true. I said, I know, these are true stories and they're poems. <laughs> so um, I call them stories. But um, we've heard these, these testimonies about what happened when people got off the car, the trains, you know, in Auschwitz, and we've seen images of all of that. So, the detail, what makes this really specific and about my family is the story about the glasses falling off. So to me, this is a poem or a testimony about stealth altruism. And there was a man who wrote a poem, a whole book about stealth altruism. And it's about, well, we say small things, but they weren't small things because every small thing that a person did was huge. My mother, I mean, they could have been killed immediately if someone had seen her pick up those glasses. So it's about people being kind to each other, you know, um, just 
keeping each other alive by having somebody there to live for. So again, this, po this poem is you know, completely constructed by images, things that you can see. And it's the end where the kind of my voice comes in, where I'm kind of imagining them breathing on each other, you know. But it's a specific image, it's a specific small story. Um, because within all of these testimonies, the testimony we're going to look at is very long, but embedded in that long testimony, there are many stories. So that's what, what I wanted to point out. So let's look at the testimony. I can go back to that on the screen. So this is the testimony that was given to me by Tali. And it's one person's, one man's testimony. And what I did was, here's the young boy. And it's about Westerbrook um, internment camp. So can we just scroll down and then come back to the beginning? Because this is a very long testimony. So there's all these pages, it keeps going. And hopefully you'll, you can get access. Okay, let's go back to the beginning because hopefully you can access this if you want to, if you would like to read the whole thing. But what I did was, you know, some of you are educators and you work with students and I've been teaching poetry all my life. So this is how I would teach a lesson, uh, a poetry lesson about the Holocaust based on testimony. And this is just one way. But also, you know, I really encourage people if you want, if you're interested or if you want to write your own poetry, this is a very easy, simple and accessible way of getting your own stories. You know, you may have your own family stories that you would like to write about. So what I did was I just focused on the first part of the testimony, which was just one scene, one story, and it's about the internment camp when they, you know, first arrived. So what I'm looking for in this testimony, in order to paint a picture and to use images, I'm looking for nouns because nouns are what paint the picture. So I'm going through and the red text is what I would underline as I'm going through this testimony for words that I can use in the poem. So we have internment camp without papers, money, and then that's how it was. I'm looking for something that tells me about this man, this person, how does he speak? What's his viewpoint? What's his attitude? How does he convey his story? And this is a phrase that I think is very personal to him and something that he chose to say. So let's go down to the next page. So here, okay, hunger. Hunger is an abstract noun, but I think of it as a noun. And then nobody died of starvation. So here again, is this kind of way he has of telling his story. We talked about how you have to step away and some, some people have to step away to tell their story. Well, he's doing it here by understatement and by irony. So this is what really brings his voice out. There was hunger, but nobody died of starvation. There was hardly ever an execution, you know? So he's bringing these, these are just really personal statements. Then I'm coming back to the hospital, that's a noun. I, there's an orchestra as a noun, but then I chose not to put it in the poem later. Now that we have this long phrase, my father and one of my uncles were sent to a Dutch hospital, a private hospital without guards, without handcuffs or chains. He was given a pass. He was told to report to this hospital and to report back when he was finished. There was only one condition, that he wasn't back by a certain time his wife and his two children would be on the next train to Auschwitz. Like to me, that was like the most powerful statement in the section. So you're looking, for, again, just looking for a really powerful statement. So then if we go down to the next, to the poem, let's skip all the way down and we come to, writing the poem. So now I've taken all those, phrases that I underlined. I left out a couple, 
but I took the main ones. So we have Wester Bork internment camp without papers, without money. That's how it was. There was hunger, but nobody died of starvation. There was hardly ever an execution. Civilian clothing, a first class hospital. My father and one of my uncles were sent to a Dutch hospital without guards, without handcuffs or chains. He was given a pass. He was told to report to this hospital and to report back when he was finished. There was only one condition, that if he wasn't back by a certain time, his wife and his two children would be on the next train to Auschwitz. Now you see what I've done here? I've taken that long, it was not a whole paragraph, but that long section, and I've broken it down into sentences and phrases because this is going to help me see like what do I actually have here? Where is the poem? Because the poem is there. It's like, you know, you know, I think about Rodin, the sculptor, who said he started with a large piece of stone and he kept carving, carving, carving away until he found the sculpture. It's the same here. Within all of these testimonies, there are poems embedded. They are there. And I am just finding it. So let's go down to the next part. So here's the poem. So I thought that statement was so strong. I think about what do I want as a title? That's how it was. Westerbork and Turnman Ken. We came without papers, without money, under guard. That's how it was. There was hunger, but nobody died of starvation. There was hardly ever execution. My father was sent to a Dutch hospital without handcuffs or chains. He was given a pass. There was only one condition. If he was not back by a certain time, his wife and children would be on the next train to Auschwitz. That's how it was. So now I feel reading this, I can feel the emotion in my body. And breaking it down into lines, I, I would do it three or four different times until I found the one that was most powerful. Now there's one line here, you know, I'm questioning whether I want to repeat that's how it was because I have it up at the beginning and then I have it down at the end. And this is something if you're interested, we could talk about it at the question period. Like what would it, how would it change the poem to take out the first one? And do you think it's more powerful with or without the repetition? And I could also repeat it more than once, you know? So these are all kind of choices you make as you're writing the poem because the writing of the poem creates emotion in me. And I think the reading of it creates another level of emotion. And so I think when you read a poem, you feel the emotion in your body. You feel you're in the experience. And that's what happens when you use images and give this one simple visual uh, story. So one, one choice I had here, um, let's see. Oh, I know, when we go up to, it says there was hardly ever. Now that break there, if I said there was hardly ever execution, I think, I don't think it's as strong as breaking the line there with ever. There was hardly ever. And then the readers left, will ever what? And then putting execution by itself there, that's, that was my kind of poetic choice. You know, when I'm working with kids, I think looking at, the structure of the poem and trying to write it in different ways, which, which whether I did on the next page, we can just take a quick look at that. So here I've broken it up into stanzas. So they're couplets, we just have two lines. And, um, you know, it's just really an interesting exercise because we start with the testimony, which is written in prose. And then you see how we start breaking it up, breaking it up, breaking it up, and then just experimenting with different ways of looking at this. You know, I just think it's an interesting way of thinking about how poets make these decisions and how they, I, create, you know, emotion through the testimony. Because I still, I, I believe the testimony, oh, can we go back to me now? 
So, um, hi again. <laughs> so I, I think that the testimony, again, um, is really important. And, you know, one thing I was thinking about, especially bringing this, you know, this whole idea of historical information making it current is to, when I work with students, you know, I, I live in, in California and I work in schools with all different age groups. And when I ask students, how many people here were born in this country? You know, I see a, sh a raise of hands, a show of hands. Then I say, how many of your parents were born in this country? Much less, you know, usually at least half the class are immigrants maybe first generation immigrants. And I'm saying this, you know, about where I live, but I think no matter where you live, everyone has a family story and everyone has a family history. And I mean, South Africa, I mean, what a rich source of family history and narratives to be heard. You know, I would love to hear stories about the Holocaust, about people who live in South Africa, about your, their own history and your own city, your own time, your own people. I just think it's so important. You know, one of the things, you know, there are things I don't like about Zoom. I mean, I'd really much rather be there and touch you, <laughs> maybe even hug you, but it's just wonderful to be connected like this with people all over the world. I, to me, it's just such a privilege. It's just such an honor, and I'm so happy to see all of you. So, um, you know, that's my little story about my book. But, you know, I thought I'd read you a couple of more poems because um, I wanted to read a poem that I wrote after I went to Auschwitz. Because, you know, I was about halfway through this book and I thought, well, you know, I think there's more here that I don't know and that I need to know. And so I, my, <clears throat> I had a beautiful diamond wedding ring. And I never, this is the ring my husband bought for me. Can you see it? It's a plain gold band. Because when we got married, I said, let's go buy a ring. And my husband said, oh, I don't want a ring. You know, I was already in my late 30s. I'd never been married before. I'm like, oh, what happened to my romantic, you know? So anyhow, um, I, he finally bought me a ring and uh, I lost the ring in Auschwitz on the march. Yes, I know. I had had the ring for just a few years and I was wearing this ring. It was raining. I don't know if Tali remembers. It was a rainy day and we were all bundled up and there was a big crowd there. So this is called Lost. I lost my wedding ring in Auschwitz in the dust of the railroad tracks, a diamond set like an eye in the blood nourished earth. The ring is buried among dead leaves and the footprints of the living who wander the barracks, chattering to quell the silence in the walls. The ghost of my grandmother will stoop back bent like a branch in the wind and cup the diamond in her hand like a fish drawn from water, still wet, the scent of my hands dim on the shimmering gold. So I was thinking about this ring that I lost and how it's now there. It's in the earth of Auschwitz with the ashes of my grandmother who died, who died there. And I want to read one more poem. And it, you know, if you're interested, I can read another poem later if you if you like. Um, but I wanted you to leave you with this poem about my mother because it really talks about resilience and how we can overcome these traumas in our lives and how I've learned from my parents. This is called Valentine's Day. Now that my father is gone, I send my mother flowers. She sleeps under a blue blanket, alone on her side of the bed, fluffing both pillows just so. She balances as she walks, one hand skimming the wall. Sometimes she doesn't know where her friends are, 
who was still living. Einstein was right about time, moving in two directions at once, how everything that happens seems to have happened before. How when I stand before the mirror combing my hair, I see my mother's eyes and happiness wells up like a wave without warning. My mother looks forward to a lunch of bread and cheese, a glass of apple juice. She speaks of the weather, today being only itself. Her time is reeling in, a line cast from shore, but how she loves the sea, the horizon, the flaming sun. My mother, who knows the brutal world, who survived while others did not, says me, I had it easy. So that is my mom. And um, and it is, we have a lot of time. Uh, I was wondering if we could go to some questions. Would that be okay? And then, I, and then I, could come, I could come back and read more from my book or, or maybe the questions will lead us into another space. Mm. Because this is the thing about Zoom. It's, you know, it's a little different from a normal <laughs> environment. <laughs> yeah. So we're just, we're just feeling our way as we go along here. Absolutely. So, so first of all, Gail, um, what I will do is I'll invite everyone to post uh, questions, comments, uh, thoughts in the chat. Uh, and um, we will have a look. Maybe we will unmute you and, and allow you to have a conversation with Gail. So let's see how this is developing. But maybe, Gail, if I can, uh, first of all, share with you that uh, there are other po poets uh, here. And uh, Adrian David is uh, saying, thank you for inviting me. I'm a fellow poet. It is an honor to be here. So I just wanted to <laughs> mention that there are some poets uh, uh, here. And also, as, as I said to you, some teachers and some other uh, enthusiasts of, of poetry. Um, Gail, maybe if if you will allow me to start uh, uh, asking you um, to tell us briefly about your parents' experiences and how, you know, how, what was the process of translating those experiences into poetry for you? And how long did it take you? Or, 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 or was it soon that you started to, to do that? So, so it's a, a double sort of, questions first about your parents because mm -hmm. you were born in Germany so so I'm quite curious about that mm -hmm. and then um, and then connect it to the writing process mm -hmm. great that's a great question so um, because I wanted to say why the book is in three parts because it really tells my family story so the first part takes place during the war the second part begins in Landsberg where my parents met and then moves into the United States and the third part is a series of elegies, poems about the dead, and brings us up to the present time, including my trip to uh, Poland with, with the March of the Living, and my mother becoming old, myself becoming old as well, my father's death. So my father, um, as I said, my father was born in a small town, Bijini, Bijin, and he, uh, he was trained as a tailor. And um, you know, another thing I wanted to say is that after reading the poems, I have some notes at the back to give people some historical information, but I think it's really interesting to look up some of these uh, events and learn more about the Holocaust that way as well, because that's what I did. And I, I actually looked up this town and, I, and there are photographs of families before the war sitting at home with the children, they're all making fabric and clothes. So my father grew up in the small town, which is uh, very close to Lodge. It's like a suburb of Lodge. Now my mother, they came from very different backgrounds and they say they never would have met had it not been for the war because my father lived, had a large family. It was more of a small town, rural area. They had horses. I always 
pictured my father living on a farm. And then when I went back there, I went to his house. I found his house. And it wasn't a town, it wasn't like that at all. There was the, there was the house, and then there was the courtyard, and right on the other side there was a, uh, four stalls for the horses. And there were many other houses and a big synagogue, and it was, you know, it was a pretty good sized town. Um, my mother, uh, so that was a poor, you know, family, large family of seven children. My mother's father was raised in a very uh, religious home. His parents died when he was quite young. This was also in a small town. So he was raised by his uh, grandparents who were Hasidic. And he left there and became a Zionist. So he was one of the really, he was a very well-known member of the city. And he was one of the first people arrested in Lodz when the Germans came in 1939. And he was sent to a, to a uh, political prison in Germany. Um, so my mother lived in Lodz for four years. And, the, and she says she got a very good job there because her father knew Rumkowski. Now, I don't know if you're familiar, if the audience is familiar, but again, I mentioned him in the notes in the book. So he was the head of the, he was the Jewish man who was the head of the, uh, the Lodge ghetto. They called him the mayor. My mother used to call him the mayor of the ghetto. So she, she so he promised uh, my grandfather, is this what you want? Am I saying too much here? I don't want to talk too much. <laughs> I'm not used to talking this much because I have students. They do all the talking. They tell me to be quiet. <laughs> so um, t just tell me, just go like this, Satali, if I'm talking too much. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so Rumkowski actually promised my grandfather that he would take care of my, the family during the war. Yes. So there's a poem in here, the first poem in the book, my mother's going to talk to Rumkowski to find out what happened to her father because they arrested him. She wanted to know where he was, you know? So anyhow, um, so my mother got a good job in the ghetto. He kept his word. They got in their own room. The family, my mother, her brother, and my grandmother had their own room in a big building. I also found this building when I went on this trip with you, Tali. And I went inside. I didn't know which apartment was my mother's, but my, the woman let us inside the building. And I went into the building and I looked out the window and there was the courtyard that my mother used to talk about where she would go down to go to the outhouse to go to the bathroom. So, I mean, this was just so emotional for me going on this trip. So my mother was in the Lodge ghetto for four years. Then the last, the le one of the last deportations, they were sent to Auschwitz. And of course her brother and her mother were sent off to the one direction she I, that's what the poem i just read you was about and then she was sent and because she was still healthy because she had this job she was still healthy so she wasn't she was in auschwitz for a few months and then she was sent to hofstadt to a labor camp and then there's a poem in the book about that she was there with 200 other women until the end of the war and um she said she was very lucky because it was in a building where they had a shower and the woman who ran the place, uh, she was very, they, she, they were afraid of lice. You know, a lot of the Germans were much, very much afraid of lice. So they insisted everyone take a shower, you know, every day. So she attributes this also to her survival that she was there and was able to, to keep clean. Um, so then after the war, my mother went back to Poland. It was a horrible experience. She came there, she knocked on the door, a former friend of theirs who was not Jewish was living in the apartment. And my mother could see through the door, she could see her mother's, her parents' furniture. She said, can I just have a picture, a piece of paper, something to take back to remember my parents? And the man said, he said, no. He said, we don't keep anything any papers that belong to Jews, we burned everything. Well, my mother, you know, she, she went, 
so the, so they wound up in, in Lonsburg because that was a, a deportation, you know, camp. And I was born there. They were waiting to get their papers so they could come to America. And um, it took a couple of years. So I came over when I was about two years old because my father had an uncle in Los Angeles. So everyone who came to the United States had to have a job before they could uh, get the permission, they had to have a, a sponsor and a job. And my father's job was a janitor, and he did that for a while. And then he worked in the garment district in Los Angeles. There's a huge garment district, and most of the people there were Jews, you know, a lot of them immigrants, survivors. And then, uh, I don't know, what else would you like to know? And I was born. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in Lonsburg. <laughs> yeah, and amazing. He had a dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Gail, first of all, amazing story. And for, for um, the audience, I mean, uh, uh, to, to have uh, your mother's story about uh, Mordechai Chaim Rumkowski, the head of the Judenrat uh, in the Wood Ghetto, the Lodge Ghetto, and the fact that they were close to him, uh, but of course, they went to Auschwitz in the last deportations in August of 1944, and Rumkowski himself was killed uh, by, the, by the Nazis, and uh, your mother survived. Um, so maybe we move to uh, uh, Michael uh, Grabman's uh, question more about your poetry. And he's asking, at what uh, stage did you decide to start writing poetry, uh, about, specifically about the Holocaust, and was it in part uh, being a daughter of Holocaust survivors? I mean, what was that process? And he's also asking, what other poetry do you enjoy writing? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, as a child, I always wanted to be a writer. You know, my, I, I didn't mention my, my grandfather was a journalist. He had other jobs as well, but I have looked for his, you know, I think he wrote for some Yiddish papers or, or maybe some he Hebrew papers in Israel, but I have not been able to find any of his articles. But my mother was very literary. She's an intellectual and she spent most of her time, as I was a child, I remember her sitting on the couch reading and taking me to the library. So I always wanted to be a writer, but it wasn't until I was in my 20s that I became a poet. And it was just because it was during the women's movement and there was a lot of women's poetry and women, women coming together and forming groups. And, and that was when I started writing poetry. Um, what was the other part of the question? Um, about um, the connection of writing about the Holocaust and the connection to your parents. Is that why you are writing? Is that your way of processing uh, being a second generation? Um, um, you know, I'm just a writer, I'm a poet, so I don't so much, uh, like I said, I was tr I've been trying, I tried writing these poems when I was in my 20s. And I was just, as a poet, I write whatever comes to me. It's like the muse comes to me. I know people say that and they, it's hard to comprehend, but, but it's true. It's like sometimes these poems just come to me and I don't know I don't consciously say to myself, this is what I'm going to write about, except in this case, I did that. Because after my father passed away, I found myself writing about him. So this was about 15 years ago. And again, I didn't decide, oh, now I'm going to write about my father. It's like, this is what came up in me because what I write about is what I'm feeling, what I'm living and what, I, what my emotions are. You know, so I started writing about him. And then after a while, I thought, you know, I keep writing. Then I started writing more poems about the Holocaust. And I thought, this is really what I want to do. So this was a really conscious decision. I was like, I need to write this book. And also, I felt like I was, my parents, my father had passed away. My mother was getting older. And I thought, I need to write her story and I want her to see it, to read it. And I just, I'm just astonished, not that I finished the book and I wrote the book, that the book was now published and that my mother is still alive and I gave her this book. It's an amazing, yeah. 
amazing gift. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> fantastic. Eva Vidavsky is writing The Lost Ring. My mother found a gold band ring in Germany after the war on the street. I have that <laughs> band. My mom knew Rumkowski's wife and had a job in the kitchen because of that. Thank you so much for your gentle wow. presentation. <laughs> but isn't that amazing uh, connection amazing. to Eva? That is amazing. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. And please yeah. continue to, uh, you know, to, to post your questions. Uh, Adrian David, that I mentioned before, who is also a poet, is asking, did you find writing poetry about the Holocaust cathartic? Uh, since these poems were based on uh, the Shoah, how difficult did you find it to spill, to, you know, to, 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 to spell your emotions and to, to um, you know, to write poetry with, uh, with, with those stories? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, as I said earlier, I felt like I needed to be older and have some distance because of the emotion. And someone, re that's interesting because someone recently asked me in, a, in an interview um, whether I get emotional when I read the poems or when I was writing the poems. And to me, writing the poems was, it was, it was, I wouldn't say cathartic, it was empowering. It was empowering to write these poems. And I didn't, I don't cry, I don't, I don't feel that kind of emotion when I'm reading or writing the poems because the emotion is in the poem. It's, it's hard to describe, it's almost, it's, it's not me, it's the poem, you know? So I feel strong, I feel glad that I've written these poems. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, it, what was your mother's reaction to the book? I know she was 98 years old, but um, someone would like to know about her reaction. That's a great question. You know, sometimes I think, what is her reaction to the book? <laughs> like, how much does she share about that? You know, I was a little nervous to read it to her, to show it to her, because there are some things in there I thought maybe she's going to object to this. You know, my mother's a very modest, private person, very formal, reserved, you know. I had a poem about in there about her teeth, how she had had her teeth pulled without anesthetic during the Holocaust. And I thought that she's not going to want to share that with people. But um, her reaction, I, she seems really happy. Because whenever I talk to her now, she says, how's the book doing? And she just seems different. I don't know. She seems really happy. I, and I think she is. I think she's proud of me. <laughs> I'm sure she is. I'm sure yeah. she is. What was her reaction for you going back to, to Auschwitz and to Lodge? She, you know, just because, you know, I said my mother doesn't often share her feelings. She didn't say anything, but she didn't say anything negative. She didn't say don't go. But you know, in, in many ways, I mean, all the Holocaust survivors are remarkable people, but each one is individual. My mother's remarkable in this respect, in one way she's remarkable is in this respect, that she doesn't hold a grudge. I know that's hard thing to say and a hard thing to believe, but I remember when I was in my 20s and I wanted to buy a Volkswagen and I thought, oh my God, I can't buy it. My parents are not going to be happy with this. I said, mom, you know, I want to buy a Volkswagen. Do you mind? I'm sorry. I have, you know, this always happens when I do a talk, my nose starts itching. <laughs> also when I go to the dentist. So please excuse me. <laughs> she said, I don't have anything against the Germans. She said there were good people and bad people. And she said, and it was on both sides. And you know, just recently, a couple of years ago, my son moved to Berlin and he, he, was, he was planning on living there. And I said, to, I said, oh, I said, mom, Nathan's moving to 
Berlin, she said, well, you know, it's not the same now as it was then. So that's, that's my mom. Yeah, very reflective. Um, um, <laughs> and and uh, um, Maximilian Kasuba is, is asking, did your parents speak about the earlier years, you know, about the rise of Hitler before the war, the, you know, the 30s? How did they reflect about that? And he's asking, um, did you write about, you know, before the Holocaust, the period before the Holocaust? And can someone write about that period? Uh, mm -hmm. From what you did with Don, Don Krauss is a local Johannesburg survivor. You took a portion of his testimony and you, you showed us how to write a, a poem. And Maximilian is asking, can you do it with any history or with any testimony? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think you can. You know, it's interesting because when my parents talked about before the war, they didn't talk about politics. They talked about their personal lives because this is what they remember. This is their home. You know, this is their country. And they had to leave. Nobody leaves by choice. They leave out of necessity and out of, you know, sadness. So when my father talked, it was always about the country, picking apples, cherries, sitting in the field with his friends, you know, going and into, out into the lake and rowing in the boat. And I include that in my book as well. My mother talks a lot about her father. She adored her father. She was an only child until she was eight years old. And her father treated her, she says, like a son because he was very political. And he took her with him to all his meetings, to his political Zionist meetings. And she was part of a group of you know, young Zionists as well. And so she talks about her good memories before the war. And, you know, I wanted to include that in my book as well. So that's why, and as far as, you know, using any kind of testimony, I think you can. You know, I, I, was, I was thinking about Charles Reznikoff, who wrote a book called Holocaust, and he, it's all based on documents and about the war, and he just used verbatim. But what he did was he took the words and he rearranged them. He put them in a different order. You know, I think there are different ways of approaching this kind of uh, information. And one is uh, to use images the way I did. Another poem I have in the book is actually a collage and it's a collage of different voices. So I've, t I've taken all these different voices from different Holocaust survivors and put them together so there are many approaches to writing poetry, historical poetry. In fact, I just took a class last weekend on writing political poems, and it was taught by uh, a man who lives in Washington. He's a poet, and he's Filipino. And we read a lot of poems by uh, African Americans, you know, different immigrants, people from different countries. Yeah. So um, Carolyn is actually saying that your poem on Don, that you don't know, I mean, we know him very, very well. He's the head of Sherita Pleta. He's a very uh, active survivor that speaks a lot in schools. And uh, he, he, for those that don't know uh, Don Krauss, he was born in, in the Netherlands and the family was deported to Westerbork. And then uh, his father was deported to Buchenwald and, and perish there, and him, his sister, and his mother were deported first to Ravensbrück, then to Sachsenhausen, uh, and then he, he ended up in the death march. So uh, Carolyn is just saying your poem on Don is very evocative and very much Don. It's very mm. much, you, you captured who he is without knowing this survivor. Mm. So um, yeah, she's saying he's a friend of mine and you, you really captured him, so well done. 
Um, I wonder, Gail, Gail, if you will be willing to read, we have a few more minutes and maybe you will be re willing to read a few of those poems, specifically the ones that you refer to, the one of the many voices, maybe mm. something yeah. about your, your mother's experiences, mm. uh, maybe for Eva, something about Lodge, about Wood, <laughs> and the, you know, the experiences of your mother there. Sure. Well, this poem, um, there's one poem here that I took, here, let me find, I'm just looking for it because normally I have everything marked beforehand, but this is more, uh, let's see, I'm looking for the poem with the many voices. Hold on just a second. Just tell me what else people are asking while I'm looking. Um, so so uh, after you read the poem, we will open up for anyone that would like to say something. So uh, the question um, part is over and um, we will love to hear maybe two more or also poems. And then we will open for anyone that would like to talk to, you know, discuss it a bit, a bit further. And we have Adrian uh, that would love to chat to you. Great. Uh, a little bit more. Um, you know, well, let me read the title poem, Blood Memory, because this is, I, you may be familiar with uh, Father Patrick Dubois. Yes, yeah, he, very he, much so. Okay, so I, I saw this documentary on television about him, and he's a French Catholic priest who's been tracking down Nazi mass graves, and he's been interviewing witnesses who were children at the time of the murders. So he found, this is a while ago, he's probably found more, but at this time he had found uh, 1,700 previously unknown execution sites. And I, I listened and read the documentary, which was on 60 Minutes, and um, I wrote this poem. This is one of the only poems in the book that is not directly about my family but I wanted to end the book with this poem because it's about other, I'm bringing in other voices, other people's voices, and it's in two parts. Blood memory. One, Dimitri watched from a tree. When a woman with a baby approached the pit, they forced her to hold the baby in sight. First they shot the baby and then her. Anna remembers. When the pit was full, they filled it with a little earth. For three days, the ground moved. Some were still alive. Anatoly speaks the names, Yanko, Rachel, as if he has been waiting all his life to say them. The dead are patient. One century bleeds into another. No one comes. The land stands as before, barren of buildings, trees slouching in rain snow falls. The earth turns over, groaning in sleep. Bodies, bones fallen one on another. Metatarsals, slender ribs, skulls leaning together. The dead shielding the dead. The living go on living. Washing hands, peeling apples, stirring soup, brushing hair, tying shoelaces and sending children off to school. They live with glass in their mouths. Part two. Last night I dreamt in Yiddish. The dead stood behind me, tilting like stalks of wheat. I recognized the faces, Zadie, Bubi, Esther, Wolf. I saw my father driving a horse through snow, frost on his ears, hands ungloved. Then he was in the fields, shaking apples from a tree, his friends behind him, sharp elbowed, frost on his ears, hands ungloved. I stood at the grave sites, feet soaked in mud. I lay down my body in wet leaves. I remembered them. So, so here's an example of taking a document. It's not about my family. But I, I did the same, I used the same process. I took segments 
of images, words, and I made it into a collage of many people's memories. So I hope that's helpful. I, you know, um, you know, I, I often read this poem. I don't know which poem about my mother. <laughs> if you want one more poem, they asked about one of the poems about these stories I was talking about. Well, there's one that I often read and it's, it's been published a bit, um, which is about my mother in the labor camp. It's, do, you, do we have time for this? Oh, we still have plenty of time. Yes, so, yes, please do. So this is this is my mother in, in the labor camp that I taught that I referred to earlier. And um, I wanted to say also that sometimes in the poems I use italics, which is direct testimony from people. In the poem that I wrote, where I, I um, based on the, the piece that you gave me, Tali, I say they, but you, one of the things I wanted to mention is you could change that to I, and think about do you want to write the poem in the first person, or do you want to write it in the third person, and how that changes the poem. You know, people might later want to think about that and um, see which is more effective, and when, it's, when one is more effective than the other. But sometimes I don't read this one out loud because there's some italics in here. So there's some uh, italics that are direct quotes from this book called Green Gables, which you may be familiar with. This is an American book that was written. My mother read it translated in Polish when she was a girl, but it's written by an American about a very feisty young woman named Anne. It's called Anne of Green, Green Gables and she lives in Canada. So this is My Mother Remembers. We walked every morning, and this is in my mother's voice. We walked every morning through the town while it was still dark, so the people could not see and could say later they did not know. We were skinny, barefoot or in torn shoes, walking on stones and in dirt to the factory where we fit metal parts into little holes. Piece by piece, bending our heads down to the work, we put the wrong part in the wrong hole so the guns would not fire. Then we walked back through the town, the smell of bread and meat in the street. After we were locked in at night, 200 women and girls, the guard gone until morning, we were left together, sitting and talking like home. I told stories from books I had read, Anne of Green Gables, and here's the quote. If I wasn't a human girl, I think I'd like to be a bee and live among the flowers. I remembered the words and told the stories until we forgot where we were. Well, there's another hope gone, leaning together on cots, a quote, my life is a perfect graveyard of buried hopes. Until soldiers threw stones at the window yelling, come out, come out, the war is over. So my mother was in this building and you, you know, my, my mother has a photographic memory and that's why she was able to tell me these stories in such detail, you know, later in her life. And she still remembers when I was writing this book, you know, a few years ago, a couple years ago, I asked her for one of the stories. She said, oh, I already told you that story. I said, I know, mom, but I'm writing a poem. I want, I want to hear the details. So she did, and it was about this, this uh, time when, she, when she, her teeth were pulled. You know, this was in the labor camp. Her teeth were pulled without any anesthetic because um, one of the women there was a dentist. And in order to give her work to do, they told her to, you know, just pull people's teeth. So anyhow, this is a story of my mom. And, uh, you know, at the end of the war, they were locked into this building and nobody, they were left there for a couple of days on their own because nobody knew if there was anybody there. So they, the, the allies threw the stones against the windows to see if anybody was in the building. 
I know, unbelievable stories. And you know, when I read these testimonies, Tolly, when I read the testimony that you sent me and every single testimony that I have read, and I have read many, they're all, ama every single story is an amazing story. Everyone has a story to tell. And I think what you're inspiring, uh, I mean, Aviva asked why, why I sent you Dawn's uh, uh, testimony. And, and the truth is I could have sent any testimony, but what we wanted to show is that from any part of testimony, you actually can do a, a, a po you can write a poem. <laughs> and if, if Gail was with us, uh, her idea was that we will all write and you know, have a bit of a workshop, but with Zoom and with 50, 60 people, it's a little bit difficult to do. But uh, what I will do uh, now, Gail, if you don't mind, is um, I will, first of all, uh, 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 allow people to, to, um, to express themselves. Uh, we, we will do it just for a few minutes. And uh, we aim to, to close in about 15 minutes. So maybe uh, if there is anyone that would like to share, you know, about, uh, about poetry, about the po poems that you read or, or about that, um, you, you, we will, we will uh, start a, a short discussion for a few minutes and, um, and, then, um, a, a, and then we will close at um, 8.30 our time. So um, I, I, I'm not sure, uh, Kath, I think that someone um, would, would like to start. Um, Adrian, is, is that you? Yes, so if you don't mind to unmute yourself first, great. Yeah, are you able to hear me? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, it's a privilege and honor to be over here. I'm Adrian. I'm uh, 22 years old and I'm from India. And uh, so uh, a couple of years back in 2018, uh, I uh, first read about the Holocaust and uh, I watched the movie Schindler's List and uh, like I uh, usually, I don't usually write poetry. I write poetry only when something moves me or something disturbs me. So uh, two years back, I uh, started writing poems of the Holocaust and uh, like uh, it's been two years and it was great uh, listening to your poems. And uh, it was uh, really great that you told that uh, writing this book was empowering rather than cathartic. And uh, um, that was, uh, uh, good to listen to and uh, also uh, the last poem you read it was really moving and the experience you associated with your mother like how she was in the labor camp that was uh, really uh, painful to listen to and uh, if you uh, if I have your permission and if I would like to take a minute I'd like to just recite a poem I had written around the holocaust if I have your permission if not not a problem Yes, of course. So this was something I wrote uh, two months back, uh, one month back, I think. So the poem's titled, Lest We Forget. So the poem goes like this. A malignant, narcissistic psychopath who, who exercised power with an iron fist sought to discover the final solution to a problem that never did exist. Hell-bent <clears throat> hell on asserting the supremacy of the imaginary so-called master race. His brainwashed sycophants decided to annihilate a community without a trace. With people confined to ghettos and camps, the racism revolved around us versus them. Even the one sitting in the high papal chair stayed silent, not daring to openly condemn. Some hidden sewers, living like rats, while a few squeezed themselves into attics. Though a handful of humans gave refuge, not many had the heart to be empathetic. Gassed, shot, starved, raped, tortured, the manifold desperate cries went unheard. Europe saw the star of David slowly fading as the continent was deprived of two-thirds. Deadly Zyklon-B fumes pervaded the air and along with it so did toxic, bitter hate. As lifeless bodies upon bodies piled high, the ongoing cataclysm didn't seem to abate. Time may heal countless things, but certainly not this eternal bruise lest we forget the sacrifice of the six million innocent Jews. Thank you. This poem is dedicated to the victims of the Shoah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Site and you can read um, uh, more of her um, more of her poems. So um, hopefully you could hear me. My internet is again a bit tricky. I'm sorry. What did you say, Tali? Sorry, my internet is not so good. Uh, I, I posted your website um, oh. in the chat, and um, for anyone that uh, I know, Adrian wanted to read more and to um, be in touch with you, and uh, there is a contact. Uh, oh, great. Through that. Um, you know, I would love to be in touch with anyone who would like to communicate with me. That would be wonderful. And thank you, Adrian, for, for, for sharing it, uh, your poem and, um, and uh, your journey of, of knowing more about, about the Shoah and, and wanting to express yourself through, through poetry. Um, and anyone else that would like, Vivian, uh, uh, Vivian wrote a beautiful, uh, a beautiful note here. Uh, the Green Gables series of books uh, is uh, one of my favorites as a young girl. Uh, oh. I, must, I must admit that it's one of my favorites. There's a new um, series on Netflix uh, about N uh -huh. <laughs> that I just watched a few months ago. Uh, uh, Vivian uh, Press is saying, uh, how interesting that you used it in one of your poems. Uh, Gail, thank you for your wonderful and uplifting talk. I don't normally read poetry, but I love yours. So oh, thank uh, you that's just much. a lovely, thank lovely. You. Um, and then um, just a note from Hedy to Gail. I admire the brave face you put on as you discuss your own poetry in a month that uh, a female poet has been honored uh, to be awarded with the Nobel, uh, Nobel Literature Prize. And that is absolutely fantastic. I find poetry of human suffering deeply disturbing. How uh, now as it must have been then. Thank you for the experience of meeting you via Zoom. And that is from Hedy Davis. Thank you. Thank you. So um, if there is anyone else that would like to say anything, uh, please um, either, Kath, maybe if you can help me, if people can uh, raise their hand or say in the chat. Uh, and if not, um, you will read some of the lovely, lovely comments uh, uh, in the chat. And um, what I would uh, say now is just a, a real thank you to Gail. You know, our journey started in 2016 in the March of the Living in Poland. And uh, I'm, 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 I'm honored that your journey of, of finding some of the, uh, um, some of those very important uh, memory stones, you know, of your, of your, your parents' life uh, we, we discovered through this journey. It, uh, I'm, I'm very honored uh, that, you know, we, we did that journey together. And thank you very much for sharing your poetry and your, uh, your thinking and also teaching us a little bit how, you know, if we're aspiring po poets and we would like to write, something about the Holocaust using testimony, we can actually do that. Uh, you showed us a, a, a simple way. We'll not be as good as you, but uh, I'm tempted to try. So, <laughs> and I think for us educators, it's a lovely way to, uh, to use. Uh, so thank you. Thank you to all of you for joining and to the Johannesburg Holocaust and Genocide Center team for, uh, for um, uh, you know, hosting us tonight, to Catherine and all. And uh, please do join us. We have another webinar uh, later this week on Thursday at seven o'clock. It will be a first part of a two-part series uh, called Facing Difficult Pasts. And it is reflecting on history in the present. This one will be with Professor Jonathan Janssen and with Professor Shirley Gilbert from the Univ University College London. And we hope that you will join us to this one that will speak about the Holocaust in South Africa in memory. And then next week on the 22nd um, at seven o'clock, it will speak about uh, the Holocaust and the genocide in Rwanda with Shirley Gilbert and Freddie Mutangula. So we hope that you will join us again. 
Thank you again. Thank you, Gail. Thank you all. Good night and all the very best. Keep safe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tali. Thanks, Gail. Thank you. Good night.